reset our focus, right? In terms of what God's doing in our lives, in our lives collectively as a church. And this series, as Phil says, really is about trying to bring some focus around these aspects of not just the church that we are right now, but the church that we're becoming and the church that God wants us to be. And we're on a journey, right? And um, as Phil said, I got given the topic, I love my church because it's a family. And I'm going to be honest this morning. When Phil spoke to me about that, I was like, oh, really? Wow. Like, and it's not that I don't love my church family. Don't get me wrong. You guys have been amazing to us. Many of you know our family don't live local. So my family are in Liverpool. Janine's family are in Manchester. And we have the rest of our family dispersed across the country. Um, and over the years, this has been, we've been here 10 years yeah, 10 years, and you guys have become our family. I'm so grateful for some of the people who've helped us out over the years, whether it's been house moves or babysitting. Like, you know, I just don't know how at times we would have got by through certain things. But even so, there's still times when I find myself thinking, you know, are we really family? Are we really family? And um, there's times when I come and I go on a Sunday, and I'm here like every week, right? Because there's no one else to play the guitar. But you know, I, you know, like I'm, I would be anyway. Don't worry. But um, you know, I come and I go, and I'm, sometimes I feel like, who did I connect with today? Not just who did I talk to, because that's different. Who did I genuinely connect with? I got to su- got to see my nan, and my nan's uh, coming up for 95. She's got Alzheimer's. Um, she's a little bit bonkers now, bless her. You know, she's lovely. She's still um, she's doing great. But, you know, you can see how the confusion is just setting in in her day-to-day life. And, you know, it's so good. I wasn't sure. I haven't seen her for quite a while because I don't get over to Liverpool that much these days because we're so busy and one thing and another. But um, every time I get over, we try and, try and if we can, catch up. And um, I, I went to the home Christmas Day with my mom just for a little bit. And I haven't seen her for ages. And I'd heard quite a lot from mom and dad that she's got to the point now where she's very forgetful and she's very repetitive, you know. Um, I mean, she's doing well. Like I say, she's 95 nearly. So, you know, to be fair, if I was 95, I don't think it would need anything like that to make me forgetful. But I went in and on, she was sat around a little table on, um, in, the, in the lounge, the residence lounge, and she saw me. And she, like, her eyes lit up and she was like, <gasps> and she was like, you're my Christmas present. You're my Christmas present. And it was such a great feeling. And uh, she must have tried to feed me sandwiches about 400 times. She must have asked me when I have arrived and when I was going back and how things were. Um, several times over, but it was so good to see her. And you look past all that because she's, she's my nan, she's my family. In the same way, you know, we were hanging out Boxing Day and I was chatting with my cousin Matt and we got into some pretty deep conversation as the night wore on. My cousin Matt is training to be a doctor. He's a staunch atheist. He's very, very liberal in a lot of his social views. And, uh, you know, as you do, these things come up when you're having a buffet, you know. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it was great to talk to him. And even though we're so different, he's my family. My brother and his wife, I didn't even see them. I was lucky I got a card off them, I think. They were up in Newcastle. We don't see each other a lot. But you know what? When we do see each other, we're family. You know, my kids, I tell them all the time, you know, doesn't matter what they do, even though they frustrate me. They're always going to be my kids. I'm always going to love them. I tell them when we're out and about, don't embarrass me. You bear the family name. You know, <laughs> you know. They're family. You know, and some of you guys already may be struggling to relate to what I'm saying, depending on your own experience. Some people don't have happy family life. I recognize that. And you may have grown up in a difficult family situation. But let me tell you, regardless of what your experience has been, God is into family. God believes in family. God is a triune being. You know, the Israelites were his people. The church is his bride. Christians are the family of God. And, you know, as we get into this this morning, I just want to ask you a few questions to mull over as we're talking, you know. Does this place feel like church to you? Or does it feel like your family? Are you just looking for a religious experience? Or are you wanting to play your part in the family? You know, I, I shared some of my concerns with Phil last week, and I got, really got an honest answer from him. And Phil's take on, on this whole thing was that he feels we're a very friendly church but we're not necessarily the most relational church. You let that, you know, sit with you for a minute, you know. People feel welcome, we think. But, you know, beyond Sundays, we kind of recognize that maybe there's not as much connection as there should be. 
And this morning, let me ask you some questions. Do you feel accepted? Do you feel like you belong? Do you feel cared for and supported? And not just by the leaders. It's not just the leader's job to do that. It's all of our job, right? right? Do you have people you relate to? You know, do you see people away from Sundays or from life group? Have you even committed to a life group? You know, where are you are? Are you on your journey of connecting with the family? Is there someone you can rely on? You know, do you speak to new people when new people come in or do you kind of keep to the same clique? Is your spiritual family growing, would you say, in terms of how many friends you have and how many other Christians you relate to? What level of relationship do you have with others? These are all things that, you know, I want to kind of cause us to think about this morning. Now, I want to feel part of a family and I sure you do as well. And like I said, this series is laying about laying foundations. It's about creating culture and talking through what the Bible says about this stuff and us considering as individuals as well as setting the culture, you know, from the platform, if you like, about not just the church that we are, but the church that we want to become. So if you're like me, if you have a moment where you think, well, I don't really feel connected, well, hopefully today we're going to shake things up a bit. We're going to talk about how we can all get a bit more connected. We're going to look at some principles together that we can all learn from. So I want to kind of start from a place of saying that, you know, there is a danger to disconnect. That's my first point this morning that I want to share with you. There is a danger to disconnect. I've already said God believes in church. He believes in family. He believes in connection with others. Church works. I believe that passionately. You know, when, um, when we first came to Sheffield, it was amazing. You know, when you're speaking to people, whether it be, you know, at the local shop or in your workplace or whatever else, where you tell them that you were off to kind of see someone who was a friend and they knew that you weren't originally from Sheffield and they would say, oh, friends? You know, who, who do you see? You've only just moved here or whatever else. And uh, that was especially true for Janine because um, I've been here for just over a year when we were engaged and Janine came over in the summer just before we got married and was trying to kind of commute between Manchester and um, work and get to know people. It was a difficult situation for her and we were obviously kind of spending time in separate homes as well, you know, because we didn't want to be seen to be kind of living together before we were married and all that. And um, Janine was in work one day and she just happened to mention to someone that she was going for coffee with a friend. And she must have only had that job a couple of weeks. And uh, someone literally said to her, friends, how have you got friends? You've only been working here like two weeks. You're from Manchester, aren't you? And she was able to say, you know, what's oh, someone from my church? And within a couple of weeks, of coming to Sheffield, of being in a church, someone had said to Janine, do you know what, do you want to go for a coffee? Now to me, that's church at its best. You know, Phil has already shared this verse, Psalm 68, 6, God sets the lonely in families. There is a place for everyone. You know, and when that scripture, you know, mentions family, I really believe it's about the church. That's the family of God. That's the place where God sets people. Yes, we have natural families, but God wants us to have spiritual families as well. You know, there's an increasingly popular view within society and amongst liberal Christians that you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. It's kind of populated a lot, propagated a lot these days. You know, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And of course, that's true. It's not going to church that makes you Christian. It isn't, your salvation isn't based on church attendance, based on the blood of Jesus. But you should go to church. Right? You should go. You should attend church regularly. In fact, I would go as far to say as you should attend, you should attend the same church regularly. You should belong to a family. You know, I've had the opportunity over the years to talk to people who are anti-church, whether they've had issues where they've had bad experiences with church, they felt let down or hurt by people. And often they'll kind of bring this thing up that, well, you know, I'm not going to church at the moment. I'm just, you know, I'm done with church. I'm still a Christian. I still believe in Jesus, but I'm not going to church anymore. You don't need to go to church to become a Christian. And I always get worried when that happens because you can see what's, you know, down the line for people. You know, that, that very quickly they will become disconnected. They'll become isolated. They'll find another place to go, another crowd to run with. Particularly true of, you know, when you see young people who go to university and, that you know, you'll say to them, have you found a church yet? No, I haven't found a church. I'm going to find one, but, you know, I'm doing all right. Before you know it, they're not going to church. They're going to the pub, the nightclub. 
they're very quickly becoming disconnected. Now, sometimes people hold that view. They do that because they don't want to be accountable. They don't want to put themselves under authority. So they'll say you don't need to go to church because they don't like the idea of leadership, of coming under someone who's saying, you know what, you shouldn't be living like this. I mean, naturally, we're, already, we're all selfish, right? We all want to do our own thing anyway. But, you know, that's, the truth is, often it's just because they don't recognize the danger of becoming disconnected. See, people were made for relationship. The best type of relationship is one in which you feel safe and it provides you with conditions in which you can thrive. Where you can be around like-minded people who share your passions, but you're still able to learn, flourish, and grow. The best place for Christians to do that is the church. You know, there is a companionship and a strength in community, and there is weakness and loneliness in isolation. Now, I was reading um, this week thinking about um, the animal kingdom and how there's lots of animals that, you know, when they're on their own, they're kind of weak, but when they're together, they're strong. And I wasn't sure what I was going to find because there's obviously lots of examples of that within the animal kingdom. But one of the most fascinating ones I came across was a starling murmuration. So I don't know, just to be clear, starlings, little birds, fly in flocks, sometimes of hundreds and thousands. Now, what's kind of... Interesting is, is they have this sense of unity when a, a star, you see a group of starlings flying together, like they synchronize their movements together. And apparently scientists have determined that the, the way they do that is they, have, they coordinate their movements with their seven nearest neighbors. So like they follow the seven next to them either side and the seven follow the seven next to them and apparently they move in groups of seven but because there's always someone Around them, they kind of all get in sync. And the idea is that when one bird changes the speed or direction, all the others will respond in the same way. And uh, they do it nearly simultaneously. And, um, you know, the whole point of that is because they're trying to make themselves as little birds look bigger. So when a predator comes, like a hawk or something else, they just think, you know, there is this massive thing in the sky and they can't pick people off. See, you know, on, on their own, of course, starlings are nothing to shout about but in a murmuration, they are literally like a force of nature. And you know, people are no different. We crave community, we crave connection, and when we're in that setting, we thrive, we're stronger, we're better. You know, many of you all know I work with them within kind of homelessness services and work with clients who are homeless, and the way that looks is we have a 55 bed hostel where we feed people and we kind of keep people engaged in activity and try and help them and support them on their journey to find their own place. Many of you would be surprised to know that a lot of guys who come to live with us, actually they don't want their own place. And that's because a lot of them fear being on their own. When they're with 55 other people, they have friends, they have connections, they have a sense of community. And just this Friday we had a guy who came back to us um, literally that morning saying that he, he, he couldn't go back to his own place, he couldn't cope, he couldn't handle it. And it wasn't because something terrible had happened, it was because he just didn't know how to function on his own. There is a danger to disconnect, stay connected. You know, Genesis 2, 18, right at the beginning of the Bible, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. You know, Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says this. It says, let us consider how we may spare one another on towards love and good deeds. Don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. In the message, that same passage says this. It says, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. You know, family isn't going to be forged on a Sunday morning. Often it's forged in crisis, actually. Sometimes it's born out of necessity. Other times it's just plain hard work. But the truth is you were never meant to do life alone. So don't. Find a family. So in the rest of the time we've got left, I want to look at the principles of really creating a culture of family. Because that's what we want to do, right? That's what we're saying. We love our church because it's a family. And if it doesn't feel like a family, we want it to feel like a family. We want to take it on that journey, right, between how it is now and where we want it to be. So what are the patterns and behaviors of a happy family? Well, I think it's fair to say before we get really into this, every family is different. You know, every family is different. 
You know, over the years, in recent years particularly, like TV has become overrun with reality shows about dysfunctional families. I don't know if anyone's a secret Kardashians fan, you know, or anything like that, but you know, I remember the Osbournes was probably the first one that I remember, Ozzy Osbourne and his family. There was Paris Hilton and her family, you know. I even remember Hulk Hogan, the wrestler, having a reality TV show about his family. And you watch these shows and you just see these people and how their families are just so different often to our own and how they just live in this totally different world. But you know, there's no bylaws that they're breaking there. They're not doing anything wrong because every family gets to decide its own culture. Now sometimes, you know, you can see the dangers of certain patterns of behavior. You can see things which can be harmful or are unhealthy. But the truth is every family has their own way of working has their own traditions. And it's the same here. There will be things in our family that you don't like and there will be things that you do like. There'll be things in other churches that you like and things that you don't like. Every family is different. There's no one size fits all and we're not looking to prescribe a model this morning. But I think it's fair to say that there are some general principles that we can all learn from and if we all sign up to, which will help the culture of family spread within the church you know, and strengthen our relationships with each other. So I'm going to, for like, I'm going to speak on this one verse now for the next 20 minutes of yeah, my time. And I just want to get this into you because it's such a good verse. If you've got a Bible, why don't you open it up at 1 Thessalonians 5. We're kind of going to do a little bit of a Bible study on this this morning in the time we've got left. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 13 to 18. Now again, I'm going to read out of a slightly different translation this morning. I'm going to read through the message. Um, I just like the way it phrases it. But you can, you, know, you can look it up in your own Bible. Let me encourage you. We're going to interact with this passage a lot now for the rest of the time we've got left together. I think this is a great launching off point when we talk about culture of family. It says this, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 13 to 18. Get along among yourselves, each doing your part. Our counsel is that you warn the freeloaders to get a move on. Gently encourage the stragglers and reach out for the exhausted, pulling them to their feet. Be attentive to individual needs and be careful that when you get on each other's nerves, you don't snap at each other. Look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. Be cheerful no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you who belong to Jesus Christ to live. I think that's so good. Yeah. I love that verse. Yeah. Okay, I've looked at this and like, there's like eight things I want to touch on. I know we've only got 20 minutes, but don't worry, I'm not going to take a long time. There's probably more in there, to be honest, if you dissect it right down. But there's some great principles here. Let's look at this together. First point is this. There's got to be a commitment to unity, Right? a commitment to unity within a family. Get along among yourselves. Get along amongst yourselves. Christmas Day, when we went over to um, my mum and dad's, we had this disaster descend upon our family and our home. Just as we're getting ready to go, Jocelyn decided that she needed something from upstairs and she didn't take off her boots. Oh, man. It was like World War 45 erupted in our house. There were muddy footprints all the way up the stairs. She has a white carpet. Oh, man. It was bad. We're in the car, and then, like, you know, Janine's trying to talk to her about the things she's doing, and she's just not bothered. She's just looking at her tablet. And I'm, like, trying really hard not to react because I'm like, it's Christmas Day. Let's be happy. But in the end, I'm like, you listen to your mother when she's speaking to you. Happy Christmas. You know, like, you know, it, it was, you know, it was terrible, man. It was, it was awful. It was not the experience I wanted to be having with my family on Christmas Day. But you know what? We pushed through it. Because we knew that we couldn't spend the rest of the day getting mad about mucky footprints, right? You know, the Bible says in Psalm 133 how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Yeah. Ephesians 4 verse 3 says, make every effort to keep the bond of unity through the spirit, through the bond of peace. Yeah. You know, being a family is hard, right? Yeah. Sometimes it takes real commitment 
to keep that sense of unity. When everybody's pulling in different directions, when everyone's at different stages of life, when everyone has different interests and needs, it takes commitment to stand together, to work through stuff together, to laugh together, to love together, to forgive together, sometimes just to live together, (laughs) to make the decision that however strange things get, you'll always find a way to get back to readdress the balance, to find common ground, common goals. But you know what? If we're really family, if we really love each other, we're gonna do it. Stay connected. We need to be committed to unity. The second thing here is there needs to be room for contribution from everyone. Look what the passage says. Each doing your part. Each doing your part. You know, in my work, I've, um, I've had the chance to work with quite a few dysfunctional families over the year. Over the years, sorry. And uh, usually that happens when you get somebody within the family who feels like someone else isn't contributing or they kind of feel taken advantage of. That's one of the first things you see. There's like an imbalance of power within the family. Somebody's not pulling the weight or somebody's just having to do everything for everybody else. I used to work with this family when I was working in a school in Rotherham and they had this um, a difficult set of situ- circumstances going on. But um, basically you had a mother and a daughter and a little boy. And uh, you know the mum had a history of substance abuse. So depending on how she was doing with stress in her life, she may or may not be on drugs and drink. And the older daughter kind of would step up at that point when she was out of it and become like the mum. You know, she would look after her little brother, she would get the food ready, she would cook, she would clean, she would keep on top of the house. But then when the mum was doing all right, like she would literally chastise the daughter for everything. You're, you're, I'm the mum, you're the daughter. And there was this weird flux in the dynamic, right, between the parent and the child. It changed all the time. And the little boy just didn't know where he fitted. He just, he just couldn't work out what was going on. You know, so what he would do is he would spend a lot of time with his dad who wasn't part of that family at all because he just wanted a quiet life. Now, here's the thing. In any relationship, a marriage, a friendship, a team, when the balance isn't right between the group, when there isn't a shared commitment, when everybody is not giving and like doing their bit, people end up feeling where they don't know where they fit in, they treading on eggshells, they don't know how they should act, react, and they get to the point where they end up, they just kind of get fed up of dealing with that negative emotion, with kind of being told off, be, be kind of, they just, it's very, very, it's unhealthy and unhelpful. And in the same way, like at many small churches like us, you know, we end up in a situation where one of the risks we run as a family is that the same people do all the same stuff for, for everyone else. Yeah. And there isn't a shared contribution from everybody Now, I'm not saying that this morning to upset anybody, but one of the things that we need to recognize is if we're gonna be a healthy family is that everybody has to contribute. Everybody has to get involved. And you can't all get involved in the same way, right? If I'm cooking a meal with my kids, you know, I can't let Beth play with the frying pan, but she can get the cheese out the cupboard or something, yeah? I can give her a task to do. In the same way, you know, we shouldn't be expecting that Within a small church, there's a small group of people who do everything. You know, don't wait to be asked to do things. Can I encourage you this morning, think about what you can get involved in. What can you contribute? Make it your business to offer, not to wait till someone offers for you. You know, as leaders, it's kind of the job of the leaders to steward, (laughs) make sure things are safe and protected, but it's also the job of leaders to empower and find places for people too. And, and, you know, and it's important that you know, we don't empower through kind of fear and control you know, or necessity. We have to make room for people to contribute. We have to create, create opportunity and we recognize that. But I think you know, everybody has a responsibility to contribute. It's not just the leader's job to find you something to do. Yeah. It's your job to offer, to see the need, to step up. Yes. You know, the, the Bible talks about the body of Christ being a situation where all parts are equally valued. They all do different jobs, but they're all equally valued. And in fact, it talks about how the sensitive parts are the ones that have the most, there should be the most reverence for them. You know, we've all got a job to do, we've all got a part to play. If we're gonna be a healthy family, everybody needs to do their bit. Let's move on. There needs to be challenge, encouragement, and support. 
The scripture says, warn the freeloaders, encourage the stragglers, reach out for the exhausted. You know, healthy families allow room for challenge. They build each other up and they stand together when times are tough. Beth, who's my youngest, is going through a real why phase. You know, you say something, Beth, come here, why? Beth, put that down, why? Beth, don't, you know, do, I was gonna use a crude example, Beth, don't do that, why? Beth, you know, it's just why, everything is why at the moment. That's pretty common. And I'm trying my hardest not to say because I said so. (laughs) Because that's not very helpful. (laughs) Actually, part of her asking why is trying to understand how the world works. Trying to figure life out. Trying to understand what's safe and what's not safe. Where the boundaries are. In the same way, healthy families allow room for challenging questions. You know? At the same time, families stand together. They support one another. Last summer, Jocelyn volunteered herself for St. Joseph's Got Talent. She goes to St. Joseph's School, and she decided she was going to take part in the summer fair. And she came to me, and she said, Dad, I want to write a song, and I want to do a song for St. Joseph's Got Talent. So at first, I was like, all right, yeah, okay, fine, we'll do it, we'll do a song. But then like, she was like, the auditions are on Monday. I was like, okay, we'll, we'll write a song. So I sat down with her, and I was like, have you got any words? Well, yeah, I've got a few words. And I think she literally had like three words. I had to flesh it out a bit. And then I was like, and have you got an idea of how the tune might go? And she's like, well, a little bit. Like, I've got this one bit. And she was singing me this one little bit. So I was like trying to figure out what key she was singing in and like trying to work out. I ended up writing this little song. And I thought, she's never going to do it. She's never going to do the audition. It's just not going to happen. Like on the day, apparently she got a standing ovation in assembly because on her own, she stood up in front of the whole school and did the audition. So then that happened, and then she's like, okay, the, like, I've got to perform at the final now at the summer fair. And I'm thinking, okay, great. So I thought, well, yeah, and you know, I've got to be honest, I had this underlying fear that I didn't want to be perceived as like one of these dads who's like encouraging their child to be like a star at the age of seven. And I was like, that's, it's like if you want to sing a song, that's your business, but you know, I really don't want to be that kind of dad in the background. And on the day, literally, it was like my worst fears were realized like, she's there, she's like standing in front of the whole school, she's first, she's all excited, the track starts to play, and she just chokes, right? She just couldn't do it. And I'm there, and I'm thinking, oh my word, I can see she's starting to get upset, I'm just thinking. Everyone stood round, there's like quite a lot of people, a couple of hundred people are watching her, and I'm like, you know, what do I do? Do I just let her choke, or do I suck it up? So literally, there is a video floating around, I walked out with my hamburger in my hand, I stood next to her and mimed the words while she sang the song in front of the people and we got through it. You see, family, family encourages. It doesn't just spectate when times are tough. It stands with people. That's what Jesus did for us, right? When we had no way back, Jesus made a way. Galatians 6 talks about how we should carry each other's burdens. Yes, yeah. Family challenges, allows room for challenge, but it strengthens and it encourages and it supports. Fourth thing here, we need to celebrate difference. Celebrate difference. There's a, a line here that says, be attentive to individual needs. You can see it, they're all highlighted there. You see, healthy family makes sure that everybody has a place at the table. You know, when we had Christmas dinner with my mom and the kids, my mom does a great Christmas dinner spread. She, um, you know, she, she always thinks about everything, you know, like she's like a proper mom in that sense. And, you know, I was looking around the table and like, you know, the kids had their individual plates and their individual cups and Beth had his seat and it was like everyone's little individual needs had been taken care of. Everybody had an equal place at the table. They were all equally valued. You know, we all have different needs. We all come from different starting points. Some of us need more attention than others. Let's be honest, some of us are needy. The rest of us, though, have a choice about how we respond to that. You know, you can write people off as needy, or you can see the bigger picture and recognize the consequences of that approach. You see, to show grace to someone is often counterintuitive. When someone wants to maximize your time, it goes against your natural response. You know, we have people in work who... You know, they make really bad choices and they don't deserve sometimes a second chance because they, you know, for example, there's a guy this weekend who was due to pay his rent. Where's your rent gone? I've spent it all on crack. 
okay. You know, like now I can say, well, you know what, mate? That's it. Off you go. On your way. You've made a bad choice. But you know, I can recognize the, the outcome of that is he has to then sleep on the streets. He won't get any help. Yeah. You know, he will literally be resigned to a life where he gets no support from anybody. Yeah. You see, the natural thing is to look at people's flaws, their mistakes, to criticize, to convince ourselves they need to know. Somebody needs to tell them. Yeah. And sometimes people do need to know. But most often, that's not the case. And actually, that's just an excuse for us to take the easy road with people. You see, if we're family, we'll make time for each other. We'll give attention where it's needed. We'll recognize that grace is getting what you don't deserve. And that's what Jesus did for us. You know, and we'll recognize that actually, if we're gonna criticize someone for needing attention and time, what's the outcome of that likely to be? We'll drive them away from church. We'll separate them from the family instead of including them and helping them to find a place with us. You see, actually, being family sometimes means putting up with people's stuff. Regardless, it means putting up with people's stuff to help them feel included, valued, and cared for. Next thing, we need to accept that sometimes we'll disagree, but we need to deal in respect and preserve dignity. That scripture that we read goes back to, says, be careful when you get on each other's nerves, you don't snap at each other. See, every family has its fallouts. Don't beat yourself up. A while ago, a uh, dear friend, I'll not say who it is, came round to our house, and they'd had a, a bit of a run-in with their partner. Like, and I'll, again, it was just something, you know, that I would class as minor, like that something that comment had been passed about the dinner, and it was not appreciated, and they'd had words, and, um, and they, like, the, the, they were just, they were gutted, they were so upset that they'd had this altercation with their partner. Now, I have to be honest, my first response is, you should have been in our house yesterday. Like, I'd have showed you what a disagreement is. You know, like, yeah. I mean, like, I was thinking, you should see what happens when we argue, when we fall out. Spinach, you know? Man, that's the least of our worries. Yeah, I just, um, but the truth is that for that person, that was a big thing. And they needed to be helped through that. See, disagreements are normal, we don't need to, but we need to manage ourselves properly. Yeah. Don't argue in front of the kids, right? That's one of the rules for most families. Yeah. You know how that translates in church? Keep your disagreements private. Don't gossip about them. Yeah. Don't bring all the family members into it. Yeah. Don't ask people to take sides. Yeah. If you disagree publicly, make up publicly. Yeah. Make sure everybody knows you've put things right. That was one of the things Dave and Hilda used to talk to us about. You know, they talked about how, as pastors and leaders, often in their church, they would, um, their Sundays were busy, and you know, often they would try their best to kind of be an example to their kids. But at times, the tension would creep in, and, and there'd be crosswords. Hilda said, "You know, if ever we had crosswords in front of the kids, we always made sure we made up in front of the kids so they knew." I thought that was a great rule for marriage and for family. You know, we have to watch what you say. Avoid words like always and never when you're confronting people. Yeah. They, ne- they don't help. Remember the person in front of you is someone you're meant to love and care for the same way that Jesus loves them. Ouch. <laughs> you see, Jesus said this in John 13, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Colossians 3.13 says, forgive us the Lord forgave you. Ecclesiastes 10 says, calmness can lay great offensive to rest. Calmness can lay great offenses to rest. Nearly there. The next thing is this. We need to believe in people and we need to work hard to help them become who they were made to be. Look for the best in each other, the passage says, and always do your best to bring it out. My wife is amazing at figuring people out. Like, she will get your number quicker than a PPI company. I joke not. (laughs) Like, she won't just cold call you. She'll know if you've been in a car accident and it wasn't your fault. <laughs> you know, like she, she, she has just got like a gift for figuring people out. She just knows. I don't know what it is. Genuinely, she'll, she can sum people up very quickly. I believe it's a real discernment thing. I'm more of a kind of always see the best in people kind of guy, you know. I'm a bit like Samuel L. Jackson and Coach Carter, you know. You will have my respect until you lose it. You know, as family, actually, we need to balance those two things. People might try and take advantage of us. They might let us down. 
We need to protect against that. But we also need to be believers in people. We should see potential, not problems. We should give people chances. We should create opportunity. We should help people grow beyond their shortcomings so they can, we can see what they're made of and they can see what they can do as well. Philippians 2.5 says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. You know, Jesus saw the best in people. Even when Judas came to betray him, he greeted him by saying this, Matthew 26.50, read it later. Do what you came for, friend. Now you think about that. Someone's about to kill you and you know they're gonna hand you over I'm not sure I'd be saying to them, do what you came for, friend. But that's what Jesus said. See, the best in people, do your best to bring it out. I'm not gonna have time to finish all this, but there are three other things I just wanna quickly touch on. The first thing is be positive. Be positive. You know, the church should be a positive place. Families should have a good time together, right? In Colossians 3, the Bible says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. You know, everyone's probably got someone in that family, in their own family, who brings the mood down, who ruins a family event. You know, someone came to our house a while back and they were playing with the kids and we hadn't seen them for a long time and they were like, oh, you know, it's nice to go. It's nice to come, but it's nice to go. <laughs> I wanted to punch them in the face. I, 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 like, you come to my house, I've been for months. Nice to come and it's nice to go. I'll show you go, I'll throw you out, you know. I didn't, I didn't, it's all right, it's all right. The next thing is we pray and we worship together. You know, the Bible tells we should pray all the time, thank God no matter happens. You know, the Bible's pretty clear when you read it that something powerful happens when people come together and worship and pray. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I was watching the football for the first time on Friday night, the uh, FA Cup, third round in a long time, first time in a long time. Yeah, FA Cup, Liverpool, Everton, Derby, it was perfect. You know, whenever I watch a football match, I always think when you see people singing on the terraces, it's like church, right? There's something powerful about it. It's like even the worst singer sounds great when they're singing on the terraces. You see, in the same way, like prayer and worship, they unify us. They cover up a lot of things that maybe we're not good at. They hold us up. They connect us to one another. They connect us to God. Two Chronicles says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. The last thing, happy families submit to the authority of the Father. The last part of this verse says this, this is the way God wants you, to, wants you who belong to Christ Jesus to live. Anybody ever said, my house, my rules? either to your kids or to someone else. See, the thing is, if we truly respect our Father, we'll honor his wishes, we'll follow his rules, we'll respect his decisions because we love him and we believe he has his best interest, our best interest at heart. I tell my kids all the time, when you pay the bills, when you earn the money. <laughs> but you know, God is our provider. He is our good shepherd. He is the lover of our souls. As a Christian, you come under his authority, his house, his rules. Naturally, that's not easy because you want to do things your own way. But God is the head of the family and he gets to make the rules. And whilst ever we're living under his roof and he's the one paying the bills, then we need to recognize his authority and submit to him. Colossians 1 18 says he's the head of the body, the church, he's the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead, so in everything he might have supremacy. One last thought as we close in prayer. Guys, do you want to come up? I've run out of time. I hope this has helped this morning. I just want to say this. The last thing I would leave you with is if you want to be family and if you want to have family, then you need to be family to others. Last thing, think about that. If you want to have family, you need to be family. There is no point complaining that no one cares if you don't take the time to care for others. There is no point complaining no one makes time for you if you don't make time for others. There is nothing to be gained from someone who desires connection but makes no effort to connect with people. Family starts with each one of us taking on these principles and making an effort to step out of our comfort zone and out of our bad habits 
to love people, to connect with people, to be there for people, to let people into our world. If we want to be a church family, then let me consider you as we close to encourage you to consider how you can relate, how you can contribute, and how you might change so others can experience family and become part of God's family. Thank you.